and welcome everybody. Um, I've got a webinar today just talking about moving to uh, Portugal, um, property implications, visa implications, and also the financial implications. My name is Andy Southgate. We've got Luis de Silva who's going to speak first. And uh, Luis, please take it away. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you, Andy, for the invitation. And welcome to those who are um, uh, listening in. I am going to, if I may, um, share my screen because that's really the best um, the best way to um, uh, to, to uh, start the presentation. Uh, so if you bear with me, I am just going to do a screen share here. Sorry, I've got um, I've now got my my um, agenda blocking my screen, uh, as is always the case. We do the dry run; it goes smoothly, and then so here we go. Just a little bit of a presentation, putting that on full screen, if I may, and hopefully everyone can can see that. Um, so um, I, I, I'm going to cover a couple of topics which are relevant to this um, to this topic of today. And, and um, uh, as you know, the, the agenda for today is really about um, the planning that is required in terms of being able to make a move to Portugal. And I'm going to start by covering off some of the routes to residency in the country, which are fundamental. Everyone needs to understand how they can actually make it into the country. And there's a big distinction, or the biggest distinction really is between um, those people who are EU nationals. So they would be living, of course, um, um, typically anywhere in the world, but have access to a, a European passport. And that gives them um, advantages such as the freedom of movement um, into and within the, the, the region. Um, it's also um, important for those who are not um, EU nationals to consider whether they have uh, in, in their ancestry, for example, some way of accessing the um, a European citizenship or a nationality. So typically this would work best with um, ancestry. So for example, parents or grandparents, this is the most direct route. Um, and I actually, it's, it's, it's so interesting how a situation changes from month to month and week to week. But um, um, I had included in the standard presentation the ancestry visa as it relates to Sephardic Jewish ancestry. But actually, because of the um, implications of the, um, of the war in Ukraine and the fact that some of the... Um, of the um, um, uh, people um, uh, who would be applying for um, Sephardic Jewish ancestry may actually have Russian ties. There is now a revisiting of this law. So um, I want to highlight that those of you who are considering the Sephardic Jewish ancestry route should also please take advice specifically in relation to um, any particular uh, links to, 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 to Russia um, in the ancestry because there is, been, there, there is being a revisiting of that, I understand, in light of what has been happening recently um, in the eastern part of, of, of Europe. Um, the other um, um, obvious route which is linked to uh, EU nationality is this question of the um, the reagrupamento familiar. It is a family regrouping, and that family regrouping basically means that the main applicant will be a European citizen, a European national, and the rest of the family that are direct dependents or, or, or spouses and so on, uh, partners, will be able to group themselves onto that, that um, um, main applicant and therefore have uh, similar rights in terms of residency within Portugal. So even though the EU citizen and national group is separate for non-EU um, uh, nationals, uh, it's, it, it's worth bearing in mind and considering whether you as a non-EU national, if you're listening to the presentation and are a non-EU national, if you have any rights um, um, associated with the, um, the uh, you know, with a family member that's an EU national. Then as far as third country nationals that have no links to EU nationals, for example, which would be the majority probably of people, um, there are two obvious routes that, that um, stand out. The first are the D type visas, so this could be the D1 working visa, D3 te technology and entrepreneurial visa, and the D7 
income visa, passive income visa, which is really the most popular current option. And one of the reasons is that it can it can use the the uh, a rental contract or the purchase of a property as the basis for proof of accommodation. So that's why it's quite popular. Or the golden visa. So this is another one of the residency routes. Um, and the golden visa is uh, via the most popular route using the golden visa is via real estate acquisition that I think still represents around 90% or so of all golden visas issued um, historically from 2012 more or less last 10 10 years or so so that is the other the other route um, there are a number of fiscal and tax considerations which um, um, I think that um, Andy is going to uh, cover off but the point I wanted to make was that NHR which is the special tax status which exists, is not a residency um, 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 status, it is a tax status. And it only exists after being put, uh, so it's after having been granted or gained uh, residency. So you can only consider applying for NHR once you have sorted out whether or not you can actually be resident um, in Portugal. And there are nuances here. For example, the golden visa typically would not be a good prerequisite for the NHR because the golden visa applicant typically would not be spending much time in country. And the NHR is predicated on people being effectively resident in, in the country, which is more uh, in line with something like a D7 um, application. So um, the other thing that I wanted to, to run through here was for those of you considering a move, uh, you will you will fall probably into one of two categories. The first is someone who knows Portugal, in this case Portugal, and who more or less understands where they wish to move to, and therefore they, they you understand whether or not you're going to take a buying decision or even a rental decision um, in, 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 and in what area that is, you know, that is, is going to happen because you have some knowledge of the country. Um, and the other group of people are people that don't know the country at all and are sort of almost coming sight unseen uh, to the country. And in that, in that sense, uh, there, will, there will often be a decision to be taken uh, as regards whether you will use a rental or a purchase. And so we've dr drawn up a little table in terms of the the the, the motivations or the categories um, or questions which would apply and lead you to 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 take a decision to rent first um, or to buy first or even to rent before buying, which is uh, often something that happens quite quite frequently among uh, many of the clients that um, that are in contact with us. So so things such as um, whether this is the final destination for you, you're not intending to move anywhere else before sort of moving on permanently, shall we say, you know. Um, whether you uh, consider Portugal to be a part-time residence in the future, whether you wanted to actually become your tax residency um, or tax residence, um, whether you want some element of, of return on investment from a property, all these questions will lead you to define and decide whether or not you wish to rent or to buy. So if any of you are in a doubt as to, as to um, uh, which route you should take, then feel free to reach out to us and we will sort of run you through some questions and, and, and help you try to uh, decide. Second thing I wanted to run through in this regard was the, the D7 versus the golden visa. I'd alluded a little bit to that uh, earlier on in the presentation, but there are some um, very distinct differences between the two and in most of the cases it will be very easy for you as an applicant or someone who wants to take up residence in Portugal to decide and to define whether the D7 or the golden visa is the more likely route and some obvious things are for example um, whether <clears throat> excuse me whether you um, intend to make a minimum investment um, for example, if you if you don't want to spend and if you want to buy, but don't want to spend more than, let's say, um, 280,000, then uh, uh, clearly, um, you know, you, you, you may well be and you're looking for a residential solution. So you want to live there. Uh, clearly, the golden visa is not going to be a good solution because the type of product that's available at 280,000 is typically investment product and that doesn't allow you to live in the property itself. And so, so that will immediately eliminate you from, from that, um, that, uh, that route. If you want to rent, for example, another stark difference, then clearly the golden visa is not going to be um, um, uh, an option. Conversely, um, if you don't want to spend much time in country, 
then clearly the D7 is not going to be a good option because uh, it requires you to effectively be resident in the country for at least six of the, the uh, months of the year, so 183 days. So that means that will point you effectively to the, the golden visa route as the preferred option. So again, same principle would apply if you have certain specific questions around which route is best for you. We deal with this all the time, uh, not only with regards to the difference between D7 and golden visa, but also within the, the golden visa areas. Um, and if I may, I'd like to spend, I'll about go up to a previous slide, which I'd shown, and maybe just clarify this question of the golden visa. <coughs> Excuse me. Some of you listening to this presentation will, uh, may have heard of the fact that the golden visa program changed at the beginning of this year. So uh, residential properties in high density areas no longer qualify. And what do I mean by residential? or what is meant, it's not what I mean, it's what the law uh, intends for it to mean. Um, residential properties are those where effectively you, you can live and, and, and no one else has a right to, for example, the exploration or the management of that property, um, or, it's, or, or it's, it's, it's a residential versus a commercial property. So the two groups of properties that will continue to qualify in high density areas are the commercial, so warehousing, restaurants, those sort of things, or the touristic property. And, and this is important to note for those of you looking at Golden Visa, and that is a tourist, because we've just had an issue with a client in this, in this sense. It was looking at a property to live in as a Golden Visa, and, we, and he loved the property, but it happened to be on a resort. And when we did the legal due diligence on that, because there were properties that were both within a touristic regime and not, and in, it, in, initially it wasn't evident as to whether this property was, 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 was touristic or not. But when the lawyer then did the due diligence, we found that the property was a touristic property. And that meant that the touristic property, um, 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 uh, in terms of its exploration, it, it, it had to be ex explored, and when I mean explored, I mean rented out, managed, and so on, by the, the group that owned the, 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 uh, the property. And so during the years in which this investor was not intending to live in the property, but only to do it as, use it as a rental income property, they had no say over its, its rental um, income. Um, the costs were fixed because there were quite high costs from a, from a management perspective. So it suddenly became a bad investment while he and his wife were not able to access that um, um, for their residence um, um, full time. So beware of that if you're looking at taking a touristic property um, and, then, and then using it and managing it by yourself, you will be limited in terms of what you can do. Um, so briefly, the D7, uh, oh, sorry, and I, and I forgot to explain the, the map. So to come back to the map, um, on this map, the blue areas are the low density areas, the gray areas, which you'll see sort of on the left hand side of the map, and along the bottom, um, are the high density areas, and then the red areas are low density areas within the high density municipality. Um, in terms of the D7 as a residency solution, important to highlight out what it is. Um, it's an income-based residency visa, so you have to prove your ability to be able to effectively support yourself in the country and not be a burden on the state. Um, and it can either be achieved in terms of its accommodation component via a property purchase with no minimum value, so the point I was making about the difference with a golden visa, or via a long-term residential rental contract. You've got to prove that you can live in a property which is deemed as residential and which has and comes accompanied with a residential contract. Um, it can be combined with tax programs, the point I was making earlier on about the NHR, um, which come after the residency process, and the application must be done from the country of origin. It's very important. You can't arrive in Portugal on a tourist visa and then sort of convert this into another visa. Um, this is not possible. You must apply from the country of origin. There are a number of challenges, which is why we recommend that people work with someone not to pay expensive consultancy fees necessarily to help you to fill in forms, but to help you uh, bring together a number of the essential points which are crucial 
so that your application can be successful. And if you jump to the bottom of this slide, you will see, uh, rather than me focusing on the challenges, which you can read on the slide itself, and, and, and Andrew will make this presentation available afterwards, so you can read that, but there are certain things that you can do from a distance. Uh, you don't have to be physically in the country, and these include the fiscal number, fiscal representation, or getting the fiscal representation, opening a bank account, getting insurance for yourself travel insurance while you you know um you get the, the 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 visa um getting a rental contract if it's a rental um or even purchasing a purchasing a property if you want to go the purchase route we have several clients who during the pandemic purchase completely sight unseen now that may not be your profile but it is possible to do and then the other point that we often mention and that is although it's not essential for the visa, but it's a practical point, and that is making sure that you have some sort of forex provider to help you transfer money between different currencies uh, and different countries at um, much better rates. Um, I don't tend to spend much time on this, on this slide because it's very busy, but I do want to point out um, a little bit about the, 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 the process. We often get people who um, approach Portugal as a new destination, and then they start asking uh, questions about properties. And the intuit of this presentation is precisely for people like myself and Andrew to point out that the important aspect of moving to a new country such as Portugal is not necessarily the property. It is, of course, an important element, but it's, it's not really the crucial one. It's asking yourself, A, a whole range of questions around what it is that you're looking to do in terms of lifestyle, where you're looking to move, the type of weather that you like, what your budget will allow you to do, and so on and so forth. And we can do some analyses at a distance very, very easily and quickly that will eliminate a series of options, typically regions of the country that are not a fit or because they don't match your budget or because the weather is not good or because you're looking for an expat population and there isn't one there or whatever. And then from, from Andrew's team, they will be able to also look at your fiscal and financial requirements to make sure that you can actually plan ahead, you know, and avoid any of the obvious pitfalls that you might face if you didn't do this in advance. So we always say to people, you know, there are a number of processes that come into play before you start doing the nice bit, which is looking around the web for a lot of properties and being amazed by the sea views and so on and so forth. That's great at an appropriate time of the process, and we don't dissuade you from doing it to keep yourself motivated. But there is a lot of other, there are a lot of other things that need to be done, which 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 effectively um, 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 have to do with the processes themselves, and they are much more um, important in terms of making sure that the process as a whole um, runs um, runs smoothly. We have a number of websites, but I, I actually wanted to share with you, if I may. Um, um, a slightly different um, screen, and I'm just going to, so if you forgive me, and I'll tell you a little bit about, about us so that you understand what it is that we can effectively um, help with, um, and I'm just going to open, if I may, forgive me, Andrew, I'm going to open another, um, another um, uh, file because it's just a little bit easier to explain and then share that screen uh, with you in the new share. So here we are. Um, we've got we've got this. So can can everyone see the new screen which says it's got sort of two a retired active retired couple um, you know and then says senior living villages. I'm just going to drop down to the um, third page of that um, um, corporate brochure, which makes it easier for us to explain what it is we do and how the people listening can come and, 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 and come to us for, for assistance rather than talking just in, in vague terms about the, co the company. The ones that are most relevant here are the ones in the middle, Portugal Senior Living and Algarve Senior Living, and then the ones on the bottom row. So Portugal Senior Living and Algarve Senior Living deal, deal with um, um, all the the processes involved in sort of investigating uh, and 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 planning the move to Portugal, things like undertaking a discovery tour, which may help you understand whether a particular area of the country is is um, is of relevance to you. Comparing different areas of 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 the country, um, um, for example, would be another another um, 
um, aspect covered by that area, by that brand within our business. Once you've arrived in the country, um, doing things such as helping with the settling in, um, going to going to uh, register at the local health center by first going to your junta de freguesia and so on and so forth. So we we don't necessarily do all of this in house anymore, but we have a number of sort of specialist partners that will help us do this as well, given our growth. And so it's sort of a one stop shop for dealing with that sort of move to to um, to Portugal. As regards the sort of things that you will require um, in terms of preparing specifically for the D7 visa, um, the, the our move to Portugal 101 brand covers that because a lot of people are approaching us ahead of time and then they're they're asking us well what can I do while I'm still in the home country and we we felt we needed to create a brand to help people sort of understand what they could do ahead of time as I explained in my my in my slide so that's the move to Portugal 101 um, in terms of the the real estate side so specifically looking for um, real estate if you're someone who wants to buy whether as a golden visa or 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 not a golden visa could even be a d7 property purchase we operate as a property finder so so we have a huge number of relationships with listing agents all over portugal in this case and we would work for you as a buyer and then liaise with these sources of, of inventory to go and find the right product and and the beauty of that is we can pretty much help anyone anywhere in the country because we are not tied by geography um and and this is precisely why the model works well because you will find if you look for real estate in Portugal that the local agent is very local even the big brands of franchises you know the, the, the ones that you've inevitably um, heard of they will be focused on maybe one area one region but they would not typically go into another region without be, it being another part of that franchise and so it's very difficult for you as a client to navigate all these different areas we simplify that on the rentals um, we have two different models. So one is we we work as a as a as a, we we manage apologies a, a, a large portfolio. I think the largest now um, in the southern part of the country, and that is and that is useful for people who want a D7 compliant, for example, contract. They will often approach us and and ask us to help them and and, and suggest properties. One point I will make there, which is um, to do with the market, is because we have been really really we've seen a huge increase in demand in the last five to six months in in requests for uh, visa compliant rentals um it's no use people asking us for sort of last minute rentals and i want a d7 compliant contract starting in may that sort of thing is almost unheard of anymore because of a lack of supply so we as a business are working typically around six months ahead of time you know we're dealing with clients that are starting to book after the summer um, and looking for long-term rental contracts after the summer so that is really important if you're looking at planning um, a, a visa and a residency in a country like portugal to plan ahead last minute planning not that the d7 allows that anyway because there's a lead time in approval but if you're looking for something like a rental for a visa application then the biggest single um point of advice we can give is plan ahead because you are likely to become extremely frustrated if you're trying to sort of scram everything in at the last um, at the last minute and in other parts of the country we do a search functionality a bit like the property finder model for the rentals because the rentals work in a slightly different way in the large cities like Lisbon and Porto of the country um, and um, and that's a little bit uh, around about us so so Hopefully the message has got across, which is that um, that we really um, encourage people to plan ahead, um, consult, especially with people like Andrew and his team about the financial and the fiscal planning. It's so, so important. And then on the operational side, then you can be in touch with a company like ours and we will hopefully help to deliver the other elements of the of the process. So um, there you go. And over and back to you, Andrew. Okay, thank you very much, Luis, um, and thank you for the presentation. Um, my name is Andy Southgate, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a senior partner here at Holborn Assets. Um, so we've discussed, you know, what, what the routes to visas are and living in Portugal. Uh, I'm going to guide you through some of the issues that you'll need to address now if uh, and when you decide to move here. Uh, first, I'll just tell you a little bit about the company. So we're an independent firm of uh, financial planners and tax advisors. And we've got offices all over the world, as you can see on the screen right now. 
Um, so we've got around about 250 people working for us as advisors, plus all the support staff, and um, around 2 billion, I think it's actually more like 2.5 billion now, of assets that we manage around the world. So that's going up all the time. Uh, what is it that we actually help our clients with? Well, they're all on the screen right now. But essentially, what we do is we give them a financial roadmap for moving to Portugal. And I'm going to provide you with some, some further information on that today as we run through. Uh, it's not exhaustive, so please do uh, take the opportunity to get in touch to um, have any discussions around your personal situation and how we might be able to, to help. So as we've heard from Luis, non-habitual residency, um, we touched on it a bit, it provides some great tax benefits, but they're not all encompassing and it's likely that most people uh, would have to restructure their financial situation when they move to Portugal. So Portugal, like most countries around the world, taxes you on your worldwide income and gains. Um, so the UK does that as well, and what most countries I've ever heard of do it. Um, one mistake I keep seeing people make is that they fall into the trap of thinking that any income they have, assets or gains, are only subject to tax in the country in which they are held or located. But that's definitely not the case, and so you need to take care and plan to restructure your financial situation accordingly. Do not try and cheat the system. There are international agreements in place, automatic exchange of information agreements, um, and it's extremely likely these days that you will be caught if you try and cheat the system. Historically, that hasn't always been the case. Uh, 30, 40 years ago, it was far easier to get away with it than it is today, and many people did. Um, but please be aware that, that that net is now closed in. Paying too much tax obviously would uh, impact on anyone's lifestyle. And often tax in Portugal on assets is, is around 28%, as we'll see in a moment. And we'll go through some examples also how uh, you can reduce that down to 3% or even lower through, through careful planning. So the kind of assets people leave behind when they move to Portugal um, and how are they taxed under the non-habitual residency regime. So often if you're from the UK, you'll have an ISA or at least a few of them. Um, they'll be taxed at 28% as would any other normal foreign savings account. Um, shares, funds, bonds, they're all 20% too, 28% uh, too, I should say. Um, so there's a theme here, obviously, which is that Portugal likes to tax things at 28%, um, especially things that, that don't arise in its own country. Um, you've also got trust, which is even worse, because with trust, you'll still be taxed at 28% if it's a UK trust, or 35% if it's offshore. But that's regardless of whether you've made any profits or not. Um, so if you receive any payment from a trust arrangement, regardless of whether it's made a gain or a loss, you'll still be taxed at either 28 or 35%. So it's pretty punitive um, taxation on that. Finally, Portugal does operate a blacklist of jurisdictions that it considers to be a tax haven or tax havens. Um, examples on the screen there, such as the Channel Islands, Gibraltar, the Cayman Islands, and so on. So if you have any assets or income or pensions or properties or anything like that arising from one of these jurisdictions, you will not benefit from the non-habitual residency regime at all. It is also far more likely that you, are, you, you will get an investigation from the Portuguese authorities if you hold assets in these jurisdictions. It doesn't necessarily mean you've done anything illegal. They just don't like blacklisted jurisdictions. Um, so on to some better news, how can you actually reduce tax? How can you save some money? Well, um, I've got an example on the screen here that we'll run through. Um, imagine you have an investment portfolio of £500,000. It doesn't have to be in pounds. I've just used that as an example. It could be euros, US dollars, and so on. Uh, imagine you've made then a gain of 50000 10%. Uh, the tax on that in Portugal is very, very simple. It's £14,000, i.e. the 28% of 50000 how do you put the same amount of money into a Portuguese tax compliant account? Um, the situation is drastically uh, improved for you because on that gain, Portugal will treat uh, the, the withdrawal of 50,000 as um, some of your original capital and some as taxable gain. In this example, um, it would work out as 4,545 pounds and 45 pence. That would be the taxable element. So you would apply the 28% tax rate to that, that figure. Uh, which would give you a total tax bill of £1,273. So just by putting your money in that type of account, you've reduced your 
your taxable gain from 28% right the way down to just 2.5%. And that would obviously make a huge difference to uh, the amount of money you've got to spend and, and the potential lifestyle you could lead. Um, Non-habitual residency, uh, last 10 years. Uh, so you'll need to think about what happens after that period. So um, if you're moving here to retire tax on pensions in 10 years, you can go from 10% into the non-habitual residency regime, right up to 48%, depending on the level of income that you actually receive. However, Portuguese compliant accounts actually experience a reduction in taxation the longer that you hold them. So after five years, um, tax on compliant accounts reduces to 80% of the taxable amount. And after eight years, it reduces to uh, reduces further to 40% of the taxable amount. So you could be paying just around 1% in tax. So that pre presents a really, really strong planning opportunity for people with, with pensions that are looking to retire here. Um, imagine you had two parts, a pension pot and a savings and investment pot. Um, what you would do is for the, the first 10 years, you would take all of the money, that, all your income from the pension pot and only pay 10% tax on that. You would then place your savings and investments inside a Portuguese compliant account and hopefully not be able to touch that for 10 years, um, during which time it'll have the opportunity to grow significantly. Um, and then after that, well, eight year period or up to 10 year period, you can then start to receive withdrawals from that and only pay the one or two percent in tax on those withdrawals. So it's really important that you consider what happens if you are applying for non habitual residency after that 10 year period, because you don't want to um, experience a huge increase in your taxation burden at that point. So talk to us about planning for 10 years down the line. Now, before we finish up, um, any other issues that they, I'd like to make you aware of, uh, if you are coming here from the UK, the UK has obviously now left the European Union and your UK advisor can no longer advise you here. So um, whether that's in Portugal or anywhere else within the European Union now. So you would have to sever that relationship and take on a new advisor. Uh, if you're looking to do any estate planning, you really should do because there is forced airship in Portugal. You cannot leave your assets uh, to whomever you wish. However, there are ways around that um, and therefore it's, it's worth exploring what they are. By all means, come and talk to us. Again, if you are from the UK, inheritance tax is still very likely to apply to your worldwide assets. That's any assets you have, not only in Portugal and the UK, but anywhere in the world. Um, that's because of a concept called domicile, which again, we are very happy to help you understand and uh, implement you know, planning strategies to help you overcome uh, any inheritance tax problems you may have. It's also important to have a will set up. Probably better to have a UK and a Portuguese will rather than having them together. And we would always recommend that you keep those issues separate. Finally, if you are coming here to retire, the DWP, that's the Department for Work and Pensions in the UK, can pay your state pensions in euros. That's a really strong benefit for a couple of reasons. First, it's very, very convenient to have it paid in euros and straight into your Portuguese account. But secondly, there is no um, commission or any charges or anything like that um, so that there would be with a currency broker or a bank. So you will get the best exchange rate that's possible to have. So we'll just wrap up from there and go to Q&A now. Thanks very much for listening. Louise and I will now <clears throat> answer any questions that you may have. Thanks very much. Um, Andrew, Andrew I actually, I... oops, sorry. I actually had a question while we wait for any other questions. I actually had a question that someone asked me and I thought I would ask, ask it to you and then you can just um, sure. just respond sort of generally, which had to do with, I'm not sure the term that you use in your presentation, those um, tax compliant um, accounts. Um, the, the person's question was, um, can those tax compliant accounts be set up at, at, at any time? In other words, could could you... Could you kind of, as part of your planning, set that up even before you've moved to Portugal, make it, or do you have to be resident there already? What, what's the, without um, being... Yeah, I mean, you would need normally to have um, uh, an address um, in Portugal. So you could, you could actually set it up. And we would often recommend that people at least start the planning process of, um, for example, selling assets if they needed to sell assets prior to moving here. Um, and then, you know, once you have a Portuguese address, 
on a Portuguese fiscal number, which you, you don't necessarily have to have received your visas or anything by then. Right. Um, you know, you can set up the account. Um, and then, you know, once you were resident, that would be that. You would, uh, you would be able to carry on. So, uh, you know, the, the, the main point I would make on that is whilst you don't necessarily have to be here, you do need an address, but even more important to do as much planning as, as, you, as you can prior to becoming tax resident in Portugal, uh, because it's often a lot easier to uh, sell assets tax efficiently prior to moving here. Yeah, yeah. Very valid point, actually. A, I remember a question in another presentation where somebody had um, somebody made that point that um, somebody was rushing to move to Portugal and then selling their primary residence in the UK after moving. And of course, then that's a huge mistake because it's subject to the capital gains tax. And whereas it would have been tax free if they'd still been resident in the UK, I believe. Yeah, I mean, it, it depends on the situation under NHR. Um, obviously, you wouldn't pay. Uh, the, the capital gains tax on a UK property, but you would still pay it in the UK. So yeah, yeah. Um, that's, in that that's scenario, what... you'd end up paying UK capital gains tax, whereas if it was your main home prior to leaving, you could have sold it without any tax at all. So those kind of issues are, um, you know, you, you need to look into them. Uh, <laughs> and then the UK does have further rules on, on your main home. Uh, and there is a time limit and, and so on on it, but you'd have to uh, you have to explore that prior to moving here. So the advice is always to do as much planning uh, before you make any big decisions as possible, so you're aware of all the issues that you may come across. Mm -hmm. And just another question I have. We don't mean to turn this into debate. If there are other questions, just let me know. But um, obviously, Holborn uh, Holborn also works in Spain, right? Um, yes. Have Have you had anyone do the ten? Uh, the 10-year NHR in Portugal and then the five-year NHR in Spain and flip between the two? Uh, no, is the answer to that. Okay, um, okay. Because I just okay. wonder, because it's actually the prerequisite periods in Spain are 10 years out, five years in. And in Portugal, it's five years out, 10 years in. And I yeah. wonder whether people could flip between the two regimes. <laughs> well, you could certainly... You could certainly um, do your ten years in Portugal and then and then leave. Um, I think you know the experiences most people have is once they're here on the ground and they're settled in, um, especially if they're coming here for retirement in their early sixties, maybe a little bit older. Ten years down the line, people tend to be in their seventies and are probably not so much up for the the upheaval that, that comes with moving countries. So it isn't some we tend to work predominantly with people who are looking to retire here. Not everybody, but predominantly. And um, because of that, um, what you'll often find is that, um, you know, it'll be the, the, I'm very unlikely to move around Europe or anywhere else after that. It does happen rare occasions. Right. For the most part, they'll settle in and, and they'll spend the rest of their days here. Mm -hmm. I'd agree with that, actually. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if there's no more questions from anyone, Luis, it's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you very much for your... Uh, yeah, thank, thank you as always. And, uh, yeah. yeah, if anyone has any questions, uh, they can be in touch. And we, I'm sure we'll try to help us as best we can. Okay. See you soon, Luis. Take All right. Care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.